Welcome to Celebration Online. My name is Stephen Daigle. I want to welcome you. Thank you so much for choosing to join us today. We have a powerful service. We're going to sense the presence and power of the Holy Spirit today as we worship Him through song, and we also lean into in a powerful message today as we continue our Ready, Set, Go message series. Before we jump in today, let me encourage you to worship along with us. Don't be a spectator. Be a participator. Maybe you can clap your hands, raise your hands, stand up. Whatever it is you can do to worship the Lord, I want to encourage you to do that from wherever you're at. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today as we worship. God, we thank you so much for the opportunity to worship you in this way, in this fashion. God, thank you for connecting us from all over the world for one purpose, which is to lift your name high and for allowing us to be here to be able to hear your voice clearly. In Jesus' name, amen.
You know, the, the psalmist says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And we're excited that you joined us in the Father's house here at Celebration Online. We're so excited for you to be here with us as we continue our Ready, Set, Go message series. Just now, we finished worshiping the Lord through singing, and we're gonna worship right now through giving. And there's two ways that you can do that here at Celebration Online. The first way is by going to celebrationchurch.org slash give. If you go to that website, there'll be some links there. It'll prompt you through our system. It'll show you how to set up reoccurring giving if you choose to give that way, or if you just want to give one time, that's the way to go. The other option is to go to webcc.info, and that's really where I want you to land today as we're about to lean into our message, because it's at webcc.info that you can also access today's sermon outline, so you can follow along with Pastor Manly Miller, who's going to be continuing our Ready, Set, Go message series. Let's go ahead and lean in for this week's message. My name is Pastor Manley. I'm one of the pastors here at Celebration Church. So excited to join you on our online campus today. Today, we're gonna be teaching from the Bible from the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is the longest public teaching discourse of Jesus. It takes place in Matthews chapters five, six, and seven. And you're probably familiar with the Sermon on the Mount some way, shape, or form. Things like the Beatitudes are in the Sermon on the Mount. The Golden Rule is in the Sermon on the Mount. If uh, you get slapped, turn the other cheek is in the Sermon on the Mount. And the Lord's Prayer is in the Sermon on the Mount. And this passage is one of the teachings that Jesus makes there. And we're, we're covering this as a part of our Ready, Set, Go sermon series. This is our third week out of three. In week one, we talked about being ready to serve all the people around us because nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And then last week, we talked about setting aside time to pray, especially for the people in our lives that need to have a relationship with the Lord. They need God's deliverance and God's healing and God's forgiveness and God's mercy and God's grace. And I hope that you've been praying for them all week. And today, in the go portion of this series, we're talking about go bring someone to church. We see the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 verses 14 to 16 when he says, you are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is to be placed on a stand. There it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, you need to let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will indeed praise our Heavenly Father. You know, it's so important that we live our lives in such a way that we are a light to the world around us. The world is full of so much darkness and blindness, and it needs the light of Christians to bring its shine upon all the world. You know, God's plan is to use all of His children to share the good news of Jesus with others and to extend to them the invitation to, in, to be a part and to join God's kingdom. I'm thinking of Romans 10 that says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on Him? unless they to believe in him. And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless somebody tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring the good news. I'm thinking about that uh, Christmas hymn, Go Tell It on the Mountain. That's a reference back to the book of Isaiah 52, which is what the scriptures say portion is from Romans 10. It's, quote, it's quoting Isaiah 52. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of the messenger who brings the good news. You know, that's what we need to do. We need to be messengers on the hilltop, bringing the good news, being the light to the world around us, being a herald, a voice, telling everyone around us the good news and the message of Jesus Christ. You know, God has called every one of us to be a light to this dark world, to be a messenger that brings the good news of Jesus, and to go out and bring other people, to invite them to come in and to be a part of the kingdom of God. This is actually what's called evangelism. And this is where the idea of a church being an evangelical church comes from. It's rooted in the word evangel, and it comes from the Latin. It literally means an angel of good. Evangel, evangel. You see the word angel there, evangelical, evangelism. The word angel's a part of it. Angel just means messenger, and that's what the world needs. It needs us to be angels that bring the message, the, the message of God's goodness and hope to the world all around us. So what does it take today to bring other people into God's kingdom? And that's what we're talking about. And I want to pull some things out of this passage in Matthew. The first thing it takes to bring others into God's kingdom is it requires accepting our call. Jesus said in Matthew 5.15 that you, that me, we're supposed to be the light 
of the world. This is our, our calling. In the Greek language, the word for church is the word ecclesia. It is the called out ones. It's got the root word kaleo, to be called. This is us. We need to accept the fact that we, when we become Christians, we accept the burden and the mantle and the anointing of the calling of God to be a light all around us. We should be burdened with bringing the gospel to the lost world. You know, I always think about this. When was the last time you led somebody to give their life to Jesus Christ? Or maybe a more appropriate question would be, when was the first time? You know, so many people never accept the burden and the calling of bringing the message and the good news of Jesus to the world around them. No one carries a burden to tell the world the good news of Jesus until they've understood that this is the calling and the mission of every single Christian. All four Gospels and the book of Acts give us a great commission, a great calling. Mark 16 says, And then Jesus told them, Go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved, but anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. You know, this is the burden when you become a Christian. You begin to understand that there's a heaven and that God has paid for our sins by sending His Son, Jesus Christ, and He has called us to salvation and then called us to go take that message to the world all around us. And we feel the burden because we also believe that just like there's a real heaven, there's a real hell, and that people are going there, and we don't want that to be anybody's future and anybody's destiny. And that burden motivates us and moves us to accept the calling to be the light of the world, to bring the good news, to be a herald, to bring this gospel, to evangelize, to tell the world around us that they indeed need to know Jesus, that they need to have salvation, and that their lives need to be changed. This should be a burden that weighs on us. I think about a pastor who's been a mentor to me, and he said when he was a young pastor, he was so excited to go preach, and he was going to be a guest preacher at a church, and when he walked in to preach, the pastor said, well, well, young man, what are you going to be preaching on? He said, man, I'm preaching on hell. I'm going to tell everybody about hell, and that's what I'm preaching on. And the pastor said, I hate to break it to you, young man, but there's no way I'm letting you preach on that. And he was just appalled. How would this guy not let me preach the truth about hell? I'm coming to bring this message. And this is what the older pastor told that young man. He said, until the fact that people go into hell brings you to tears, then you're not ready to preach on that subject. What he was telling him is, you can't be arrogant and flippant when you talk about this. You need to preach on this from a place of burden." Every one of us should be burdened for the people we love and care about the most, about their salvation and about their relationship with the Lord. It should be such a heavy burden that it leads us to fulfill the calling to be the light to the world around us. When you've got that weight, that mission, that perspective, now you're ready to start bringing the good news and invite other people in. Every single one of us should be burdened with the good news the message of Jesus, and we should be burdened by the fact that everybody in the world around us needs to hear this. This is what it means to accept God's calling. The second thing it takes to bring others into God's kingdom is it requires rejecting our fears. Jesus said, no one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Unfortunately, many Christians have made their faith a private matter. They've buried their testimony and they've hidden the light that God has placed within them. This is because we're so afraid of what other people think about us. My father told me when I was a young man, you know, Manly, what other people think about you is none of your business. And despite the fact that I accept that as a truth, I carry that burden. I see, you know, many times I'm afraid of sharing my faith. We all deal with that. We're afraid of being rejected. We're afraid of the gospel being rejected, Jesus being rejected, the Holy Spirit being rejected. We're afraid of ourselves being rejected. We're afraid of other people judging us or thinking less of us because we've invited them or we've shared our faith, or we've told them about our relationship with the Lord. And a lot of times we're afraid of being embarrassed. We don't want to be an embarrassment to ourselves or to the Lord. And the, this fear, it holds us back. First Peter chapter 2 says this, but you're not like that. You're a chosen people. You were royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for He called you out of darkness and into 
this wonderful light. You know, I remember when I was a brand new Christian, I was coming to church and I ran into this guy and he was a, he was a street preacher, a street evangelist. And he had done some work for a person. They had gone to his house and served them. This was after Hurricane Katrina. They went out and gutted the person's house and he was talking to the person. He's like, man, I want to pray for you. And he said, man, has there ever been a time in your life where you've asked Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of your life? And the guy said, man, to be honest, no, I haven't. And the street evangelist told him, he said, well, man, what's keeping you from making that decision right now? And the guy thought for a minute and he said, man, there's nothing. And so right then and there, he led that guy to surrender his life to Jesus Christ. And as a young Christian, I'm hearing this and I'm like, man, I didn't even know you could do that. You could just say to a person, what's keeping you from doing that right now? Well, that was on a Saturday morning. That evening, we had Saturday night church. It was here at Celebration Church. And the service was going on. And right before the service, I I met this guy. He was a a girl's boyfriend that she had brought in. And he was really arrogant. He really turned me off. And they were sitting right behind me in the service. And when we got to the altar call portion of the service, the decision ministry time, the pastor said every head bowed, every eye closed. We're all standing. I got this burden, this calling from the Lord. And the Lord told me to turn around and ask the guy behind me, had he ever accepted Jesus as his personal Lord and Savior and made Jesus the Lord of his life. And I was so scared. I was worried about what he would think about me. I was worried about how weird I would come across. I was worried about being embarrassed right there in the middle of the service. And as I stood there, I was just trying to find every excuse not to do it. And it was funny because I was like, man, I really hope the music just ends and the service goes on and I can just act like this didn't happen. And the pastor got up and he's like, man, I just really feel the Lord's burden that we just need to keep the music going. There's somebody here that needs to make a decision today. And it was like God was laughing at me. And finally, I got up enough courage and I turned around and I asked that young man, his name was Chris. I said, Chris, man, I know we just met, but I feel like the Lord put it on my heart. Has there ever been a time in your life that you've asked Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of your life? And he said, no, man, I never have. And I said, what's keeping you from doing that right now? And he said, nothing. And I said, man, pray with me. And right there on the second row of church, his head was on my shoulder. He started bawling, crying. It was ugly crying. It was snot all over my shoulder as he gave his life to the Lord. And it was a moment that God spoke to me and said, man, what you so afraid of when I'm for you, who can be against you? And I would love to say every testimony happens just like that. But the truth is, Just a few years ago, me and my wife, we were eating breakfast. I had my youngest son, Sammy, with me. He was about three years old. We were at another broken egg on Harrison Avenue. And it was a little restaurant. It looked like a little house that was converting. There was this room in the back. And me and Dana went back there, and we had Sammy with us. It was a Friday morning. And as we're eating breakfast, there's another couple with their son sitting in the same room. And their son had some, some challenges. He had some disabilities. He wore a helmet. He was seated in a special chair. And all throughout breakfast, he had seizures. And they were doing their best to kind of take care of him. And they sparked up a conversation with me and Dana. And we started talking. And while we were there, I felt so burdened to invite them to come to church. And through the course of breakfast, I just kept making excuses. And they got up and they left. And I never did extend that invitation. And that day still haunts me because I allowed the fear of the devil to mute me sharing my faith with those people. And I've been praying that God would one day again give me another opportunity. And the reality is we all face that. We're all human. On one day, I had this confidence and this boldness to talk to a stranger. And on another day, I had this fear. You know, the devil, he uses fear as the primary method to mute the gospel of Jesus Christ. But in Deuteronomy 20, the Lord reminds us, when you go out to fight your enemies and you face horses and chariots and an army that's greater than your own, do not be afraid. The Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt will always be with you. We've got to remember when God calls us and he challenges us to share our faith, to invite someone to church, to bring the good news, we don't have to be afraid of anything because when the Lord is with us, we don't need to be afraid. The third thing it takes if we want to bring others into God's kingdom as it requires influencing our world. Jesus said in verse 15 there, instead a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone 
in the house. Think about light. When light comes in contact with darkness, it brings light, it brings revelation, it brings discernment, it brings truth. When the light comes on, you see clearly for the first time. When the light comes on, you know what's there. I mean, I think about this. I got a bunch of little kids. You know, when you go up in the middle of the night and you got kids and the lights are off and it's dark, you start walking real cautiously because the last thing you want to do is step on a Lego because then in that moment you find out just how saved you really are. When the lights come on though, you've got safety. You've got freedom. You can move quickly. And this is what the world needs. The world needs the light of God. God has placed this light within our souls with salvation and it's meant to transform the world all around us. I think about 2 Corinthians chapter 3. It says, clearly, you're a letter from Christ showing the result of our ministry among you. This letter is not written with pen and ink, but with the spirit of the living God. It's carved not on tablets of stone, but it's carved on human hearts. God is telling you that me and you, my friend, we're supposed to be the new New Testament epistle. Go into the world around us. Be in the letter of Christ's love and a light to the world around us. It wasn't written with pen and ink, but with the spirit of the living God. It wasn't carved on a tablet of stone, but it was carved on your heart. You are the light of the world, and you're supposed to be influencing the world all around you. We influence the world when we pray for those who've been blinded. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They're unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, which is the exact likeness of God. You know, if you saw a person that was physically blind, you wouldn't judge them for being blind. So why is it when we see a person who's spiritually blind, we get mad at them or frustrated with them or impatient or we lose our kindness or our tolerance or our grace or our mercy? We don't judge a person for being physically blind. So why do we judge people who are spiritually blind? See, when we judge people, we condemn. But when we care for them, then we intercede. We start praying on their behalf. We start praying that God would open their minds, that they would see that it would make sense. This passage says they're unable to see the glorious light of the good news and they don't understand the message. Start praying for those that you love, for the scales to fall from their eyes, for them to see the spiritual truth, for them to have revelation and discernment and security and freedom and all these things that come when they can see spiritually for the very first time. I think about amazing grace that says, I once was blind, but now I see. That's what we need the people in our lives to do. We need them to see, and we gotta be praying for those who've been blinded. Another way we influence the world is by inviting people to church. There's a parable that Jesus tells in Luke chapter 14. It's the parable of the great banquet. He says a landowner wants to throw this great banquet and he sends his servant out to invite anyone to come. And all the people he sends an invitation to at first begin making excuses. And when the servant comes, he says, man, there's still more room. And the great leader tells him after the people made excuses, I want you to go quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame, Go out, there's that commissioning, go out into the country lanes and behind the hedges and urge anyone that you can find to come so that the house will be full. We need to bring everyone into God's kingdom until the house is full. I had a person tell me one time, man, I don't understand. The church is already big. Why do you want the church to keep growing? Because we want the church to keep growing until there's no more lost people, until the house is is full. That's what the, 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 the owner, that's what the father, that's what the commander, that's what the master has called us to do. We're his servant. We go out and we bring people in. Who's the people in your life, in your community, in your family, in your friend circle, in your workplace that you need to invite and bring in to come into the kingdom of God? Who are you going to invite? Next week's Easter Sunday, people are more likely to come to church for Easter than at any other time. I don't care if it's in person, if it's online, whatever way you influence the world around you, you need to get the message and ministry and the Spirit of God in front of them so that they can come to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ and their life can be changed. We also influence in the world around us by sharing our testimony. In Mark chapter 5, it's the story of Jesus 
interacting with the Gerasene demoniac. He was a man who was so tormented by demons that he stripped all of his clothes off and he would run around naked, tormenting people. He would scratch himself and he would cut himself with rocks. He was so crazy and wild that they locked him up in a cemetery. They would put him in chains and he would rip out of them because he was just so tormented. And when Jesus saw him, he said, man, I want the demons that are in you to come out. And it says it was a legion. It was many demons. This man who was tormented, when the city folks came back, they saw him. He was seated and he was clothed and he was in his right mind. All scholars think that this was the very first non-Jewish convert. The area of the Gerasenes were... Uh, Gentiles. They weren't even Jewish people. And this was the first convert. And the man told Jesus, I'm going to go with you wherever you go. And this was Jesus's response to him in Mark 5 verse 19. No, go home to your family and tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been. Think about those two things. That's what sharing a testimony is. It's number one, being grateful for what the Lord has done. And then it's being forgiven for what I have done. I testify to the world around me all the great things the Lord has done for me, and I testify to the world around me how much forgiveness I've experienced for what I have done. God wipes my slate clean and continues to pour out his goodness and his blessing, and all I need to be is a testimony to the world around me. Then we need to minister to others in crisis. That's how we influence the world. Galatians 6 says this, Share each other's burdens, and in this way, obey the law of Christ. If you think you're too important to help someone else, you're only fooling yourselves. You're not that important. Every one of us has to look at somebody else's crisis as an opportunity to share their burden with them. And in sharing their burden and administering to them, we often find the opportunity to bring them into God's kingdom. People often look for the Lord when they face times of crisis, challenge, opposition, and difficulty. When they go through the death of a loved one, when a marriage ends in divorce, when they find themselves facing depression and despair, when they end up in prison, when they find themselves in pain, when they've been rejected or stabbed in the back or hurt by someone that they love in the throes of addiction when their world collapses around them. It is in these moments that people begin to look outside of themselves. And when we come along and share the burden, that's what gives us the opportunity to minister and to influence them and to be able to bring the light of Christ into their life. You know, every one of us has to ask ourselves, am I a burden giver or am I a burden sharer? Is my life a burden to somebody else? Or do I come alongside them in the midst of their burdens, in the midst of their crisis? Share that burden with them to minister to them and to love them. And then the last thing when it comes to influence in the world is we need to extend kindness to the lost. I remember when I was a, a young Christian, it was the early 2000s. Now, everybody's influenced by the church music of today, the Hill songs and the Bethels and the Elevation churches and these albums that come out. But I grew up in the days where you were influenced by the Wild Worship CDs. Man, they get a CD every year come out, and it was the top 30 Christian worship songs. And I remember one of the great influences of those days were the passion conferences of Louis Giglio and this Christian music artist named Chris Tomlin. And Chris Tomlin had a song called Kindness. And the words of that song said, it's your kindness, Lord, that leads people to repentance. And I remember as a new Christian, that was so shocking to me because I always heard people preaching hellfire and brimstone, turn a burn, sanctify a french fry. And here I hear Chris Tomlin talking about it's the kindness of the Lord that leads people to repentance. And the truth is, that's straight out the scripture. Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does it mean nothing to you? Can't you see that it's the kindness of the Lord that leads people to repentance? Can't you see that it's his kindness that's intended to turn you from your sin? People don't need God's judgment. They need God's kindness. God's judgment is already there. God's kindness is what came into this world when Jesus was incarnated and he left heaven and he stretched out his hands on the cross to die for me and you. That was God's kindness, his mercy, his grace, his forgiveness. Do you represent the Lord's kindness and tolerance and patience to the people around you? Because that's what leads people to repentance in their life. The fourth thing we see from this passage when we want to bring God, other people into God's kingdom is it requires that we're living out our faith. In verse 16, Jesus said, Let your good deeds shine out for all the world to see. 
You know, the greatest amplification to share in your faith is live in your faith. And the greatest diminishment to share in your faith is living like a hypocrite. That's the opposite of living out your faith. Being a hypocrite is when you say you believe one thing and you act in a different way. I remember a young girl named Erin coming to church for the very first time. Right here at Celebration Church, she attended our, our Metairie New Orleans campus. She walked in and she saw her boss. And when she saw her boss, she said, wait, that guy comes to church? She said, if you saw him at the workplace, you would never think that's the kind of guy that goes to church. And I just thought, man, I never want to have that testimony, the testimony of a hypocrite. The truth is, if he would have invited her, she never would have came because she saw how he lived his life. But when you live for the Lord and you act like the Lord and you represent the Lord and you extend the invitation to come, always people will give you that respect. It says this in 1 Peter 3. You must worship Christ as the Lord of your life. And if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But check this out. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they'll be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Jesus Christ. I hate to tell you this, but it's hypocritical to share a gospel of love, grace, and mercy in a harsh and disrespectful manner. Live your life with gentleness and respect. Keep your conscience clear and let the goodness of your life be what amplifies the message of the goodness of Christ. To close out our message today, let me give you this last point. If we want to bring people into God's kingdom, the final thing it requires is it requires knowing our role. You know, it says that we're to be the light of the world, but Jesus wraps it up by saying, once you're a light and you're influence and you begin to bring this message of goodness to the world around you, it's for the purpose that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. It is not our job to make people praise the Lord. It's just our job to be the light of the world, to be an influence, to sow the seeds of faith, to share the good news. It's our role and responsibility to share the gospel, to plant seeds, to invite people to church, to represent the Lord, to live out our testimony. It's God's responsibility to convict people. It's God's responsibility to challenge people. It's God's responsibility to bring people to salvation. 1 Corinthians 3 says this, it's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is that it's God who makes the seed grow. The one who plants and the one who waters both work together for the same purpose, and both will be rewarded for their own hard work. For we're both God's workers, and the people are God's field, and they become God's building the church when we let God do His work of building it up. All our job is to do is to be the light of the world. All our job is to do is to sow the seeds of the Word of God. All it's our job to do is to be a messenger of the good news, to be an evangelist of a gospel, to go out and invite people in. When we do our job, we leave the rest up to the Lord. We're supposed to do our part and then leave the rest up to Him. We know our role. We sow the seeds, we plant the seeds, we water the seeds. We leave it up to God to be the one who makes it grow. If we want to represent the Lord well, if we want to be the light of the world, then we need to bring the light of Christ to the world that we live in. When we do this, we diminish the sin, the darkness, the oppression, and the deceit that the God of this world, Satan, has brought in. In John 8, 12, Jesus said this, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you'll have the light that leads to life. Jesus is the only solution for the spiritual darkness that you and I see in this world. So let's go out today, be in His light, bringing goodness and the grace of God to the world all around us. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I pray that every one of us listening to your word right now would be reminded that you are the light of the world and that you've given us the Holy Spirit of God to expose that light to the darkness all around us. The darkness tries to extinguish the light, but your word says it will never be successful. 
Let us be your light to the world around us, bringing influence and goodness in your good news today. Might people in our lives know how much you love them and that we've invited them in so that your house would be full. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Well, that was a very challenging and encouraging message from Pastor Manley Millers. He was challenging us to be the light of Jesus, to make sure that we extend that invitation to those around us, to live the life that we need to live. That's a great witness. And I want to encourage you and let you know that Easter is right around the corner, and it has never been easier to invite people to join us to service, especially here at Celebration Online. In fact, we have a special Good Friday online service here happening on Friday at 7 p.m. here on our Facebook page, Celebration Celebration Church and our YouTube page, Celebration Church NOLA. Really want to encourage you to be inviting people to join you for that Good Friday service and for our Easter service here at Celebration Online. It's easy. All you do is share a link. You can text someone. You can send someone an email. You can tag someone in this video. In fact, what I want you to do right now, I want to encourage you to hit the share button. Let people hear this message that need, need to hear. Everyone needs to hear it. But I want to encourage you to, to activate your faith, to activate your witness um, during this Easter season because God wants to do incredible things in and through you and the invitations that we are going to extend in the coming days. Second thing I want you to do is go to webcc.info. Let us know if you prayed with Pastor Manley today. Let us know if you made a decision and let us know if there's someone in your life that you are wanting to invite to our Easter service, someone that you're praying for. We want to pray along with you, believing that God's going to do something incredible. Webcc.info, click the Make Decision tab and hit the Submit form so that we can be praying along with you. And the third and final thing is make sure you subscribe to our page here. Wherever, whatever platform you're streaming the service from, make sure you subscribe because in the coming days, as we upload videos, as we have live services, you want to be the first to know about those. Make sure you are prepared for Easter weekend here at Celebration Online. We have incredible services prepared once again on Good Friday online service and then our typical Sunday morning service as we celebrate the risen Savior. Can't wait to see what God is going to do. Make sure you extend that invitation. We'll see you here on Good Friday here at Celebration Online or next Sunday for Easter.